Uh, now, this particular subject matter is one of the one, ones closest to me. Yeah, yeah, it is for many people. All right. Um, so, uh, also, I'm sorry if I'm a bit scatterbrained today. I've had a really long and cosmically unsettling day. As have many people, apparently. Apparently, today is just like a day that wasn't supposed to happen, I guess. It, it's been like this the last week for me. There's been like three years worth of drama rolled into several days. It's amazing how that happens. So last time we talked about changing setting, right? And the most obvious ways to do this are leaving a location. And the last thing that we talked about was consent when touching people that are tripping, as well as the notion of ensuring that you have everything that you could need being properly packed, as you might say, if you're taking someone who is tripping outside of an indoor environment and moving them into an outdoor environment. So that's setting. Now, in terms of helping someone change set, and I know we're just like landing right in this today, um, it is because I don't want to run out of time. Um, in terms of changing your set, this is probably the most difficult thing to do if you're trip sending for someone on psychedelics. Um, and there are two main tactics that I would recommend using, just broadly speaking here. And which one you use will kind of depend on the specific situation and context of the person that you're trip sitting for. So the two that I categorize, and this is just like an arbitrary categorization that I've created, are distraction versus grounded support. And this kind of applies just in general when people are feeling shitty, you know, like it's not always going to work to try and distract someone from feeling terrible if the reason that they're feeling terrible is really deeply seated. And it's also probably not going to be very helpful to try and ground someone who is freaking out over something that is like completely superficial and contrived and like you can get rid of it easily, right? So you have to kind of pick and choose which one of these you'll use. Now distraction, I would say, is most effective if you're trying to unstick someone from a negative thought process or loop. If someone is stuck, if they need to get kind of jolted out of something. Um, this is good for dark thinking, it's good for repetitive thinking, and if this person is really mistrusting or paranoid, this is a really good way of gaining a little bit of rapport with that person because you are co-distracted, like you're distracted together. Now this can come in the form of either distracting them with an activity or with a thought or with an object. Um, one example of this was I, I knew someone a couple of years ago who told me that they were trip sitting for someone and this person was just like looping and freaking out and uh, this person like pulled, oh, whoops, ouch. <laughs> this person pulled a thread off of their jeans and said, now I have two pairs of pants. And the person who was tripping just lost their shit and was cracking up, like could not contain themselves. And then there's grounded support. Um, weird. Then there's grounded support, which is encouraging the exploration of difficult subjects. And this is definitely quite a lot more difficult because you have to be very, very intentional about it, especially because sometimes exploring those difficult subjects can lead people down even more substantial paths. And so before doing this, before kind of encouraging someone to move through these difficult thoughts that they might be having, this difficult experience they might be having, it's always a good idea to make sure that you have good rapport with them in the moment, right? Like that's a really essential part of this. Otherwise, if that person ends up going down a road that is really uncomfortable or really significant for them and they don't fully trust you, they're not fully on board with you, it can be a lot more difficult and it can lead to some unintended consequences. Now, this again requires some calculation. It requires some thinking. And often this can come in the form of asking pointed questions, right? So don't spoon feed information, but you can ask questions that will kind of lead a person into areas where they feel safe and comfortable exploring difficult or intense feelings. Um, ways that you can kind of shape this are through sensory play as well as just speaking with that person. Oftentimes people that are tripping have really kind of vast and directionless sensation-based thoughts and condensing those into something that is like a sensory tangible thing can make it a lot easier to dissect and make it more chronological, make it more digestible. So we'll look at kind of how we can do that in a minute. So some concrete examples of how to change set on psychedelics um, if you're with someone else. And this can also work for yourself, right? You kind of like the difference between Socratic method and lecturing. Yeah, I would say so. It's, it's mainly just kind of on the principle of like, you are there not to direct a person's experience, but 
you can kind of help them feel safe and supported as they explore various avenues that might give them really helpful information or revelations. So um, some examples of how you can change your set are reminders and encouragement. And this can come in the form of reminding someone to release control over the situation. Many people tell me that the number one fear that they have of doing psychedelics and drugs in general is that they don't wanna be out of control. I have bad news for you. You are inherently out of control in general 24 seven. So this is a major lesson that a lot of people learn on psychedelics is that, that, and this is kind of a sneaky, a disguised one sometimes, is that sometimes the lesson is that the only way to really be in control is by making peace with being out of control. And this can be a very impactful lesson for many people on psychedelics, especially if they have a really tight grip on wanting to control themselves and their environment. Um, also reminding people to focus their mental energy instead on instead of on their thought processes on the very interesting and often very beautiful sensory elements of tripping so look at your visuals pay attention to this music feel this texture with me um, and you can also ask people directly while they're tripping how are you going to make this into an experience that you can grow from and obviously if a person is tripping too hard that's not a question that you can ask them, but if they're pretty lucid and they're on like a low, moderate dose, you can often ask them things like, hey, you know that this is going to be something that can really benefit you, even if it doesn't feel like it, you just have to let it. Like, how are you going to let it? And that, again, is kind of releasing control of this specific situation, and you can remind people, like, you're going to come down. You have however many hours, let's say 12 hours on LSD, to have this experience that you can only have on psychedelics, you're guaranteed to become sober again. I mean, like with 99.99% confidence, if not more. Um, so like, how are you gonna use that? You know, like you're here. It doesn't matter whether you want to be or not. You can't stop it for the most part. So like, how are you going to deal with it? How are you going to apply these things? Um, and also remind them that like whatever's happening is indeed okay, even if it doesn't seem like it is, like it is going to benefit them if they let it. Um, if a person has a lot of anxiety, four, seven, eight breathing is very helpful for this. You hold or you breathe in slowly for four seconds, slow deep breaths, make sure that your lower stomach expands. Hold for seven seconds and exhale for eight seconds. You can ask this person, what is something that you can do for yourself right now? A small thing that you can do for yourself right now, anything can become a brainstorming session on positive coping mechanisms. Um, this next one was actually recommended by the Manual of Psychedelic Support, which some of you might be familiar with. And when I first read this, I was like, what the hell? <laughs> Why would you ask someone this question? But the logic behind it was that there was a person that was becoming very paranoid and mistrusting and anxious that had wandered into the Zendo at Burning Man or something like that. And the assigned trip sitter asked them, like or was like yeah you seem like you're you're feeling really anxious right now can you tell me like how i i could feel anxious like you are and this person was kind of caught off guard by this and then they started describing like how you start to feel really anxious like as a step by step and halfway through just started laughing if i remember correctly because they realized how ridiculous it sounded and ended up feeling a lot better um and then you can also ask someone to give you information. Tell me a story. Tell me about what you're seeing. Tell me about a place that you love, a person that you love, a food that you love. Like describe something that you love to me or tell me about something else. Um, this is a really good way of kind of like knocking someone's focus into a different sphere because if you're trying to recall something, your brain is redirected to an extent. Um, guided journey, this is just like, this is not an official term. I just coined it because it's, you know, it sounds really corny and heady, but whatever, it's what's happening. This is um, something that's very useful for people that are feeling super anxious and are very lucid while they're tripping, who can be like, I'm uncomfortable right now, I'm having a hard time, can you help me? And this is one of the most effective things that I've ever done while trip sitting, and I highly recommend trying it out sometime. Um, you can ask the person, can I like guide you through a story? And oftentimes they'll say yes, and they'll say, okay, close your eyes, you'll instruct them on how to relax their body, and then you'll start telling them what to envision. And the cool thing about psychedelics is that you don't have to give them much, you know, your brain will fill in the gaps. So if you start out with, you want like really friendly imagery here. My favorite is um, the White Palace. 
And this is where I'll tell people, okay, we're approaching a set of large white marble doors with glass, stained glass inlays and gold etching in the sides and huge handles and you grab the handle and you push the door open and there's a marble corridor, a white marble corridor in front of you with two huge windows at the end and a fountain and two curving staircases and on your left you look and you see a banquet table that's just full of all kinds of jeweled fruits and jeweled statues of animals that are alive and walking around. Tell me what fruits are on the table. Tell me what animals are walking around. Tell me what's in this display cabinet that we're walking up to right now. What kind of wood is this cabinet made of? And this often is so distracting, first of all, that whatever the prior train of thought was kind of fades a little bit, but also gives that person the opportunity to see something that is frequently really beautiful because, you know, if you take something that is like a classically beautiful setting like that on psychedelics, your closed eye visuals will often like really reflect that. They'll start to develop by themselves and kind of scroll out outside of a person's conscious control. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and this is very comforting for people because often one of the scariest parts of tripping if you're having a hard time is that it can be difficult to know where to redirect your thinking. And if someone is like, I'm trying to like not think about this thing, or I'm trying to not go down this rabbit hole of, of dark feelings, then having some kind of cue can just get that ball rolling in a different direction. Now, um, sometimes, you know, this doesn't quite go as planned if you start with something that could be interpreted as a bit too dark, like we're in a forest and like there are trees everywhere and the person's like, they have eyeballs and you're like, that's not the direction this is supposed to go in, but it's your brain, not mine. So if that happens, you can kind of like gently redirect and be like, here's exactly what you're looking at right now. And again, this person's mind will still continue to go on its own direction. If it starts to go in a place that is like not beneficial, then you can have them open their eyes and recenter with you and like feel their body and feel their surroundings. And then maybe try again with a different scene. Um, beaches are usually pretty easy. Stuff that isn't dark by nature. Um, if a person is in need of other things to do, and I'll say that a pretty common experience for new psychonauts is that they'll be on something like acid and they'll have this thought of like, what am I supposed to be doing right now? Like, what is the point? Like, where is this going? <laughs> and um, so it's, it's often helpful to have like concrete activities that a person can do because sometimes they'll get stuck in this doldrum of the like, they see their life tumbling out into the infinite abyss in front of them with no structure and goalposts and they just like age and die that's scary and also is easy to happen to like recent college graduates, you know? <laughs> um, so it's, it is easy to get in that, like, what am I supposed to be doing? And also it can lead to other thoughts, like what am I supposed to be doing in general? Like existential dread basically. And to counteract this both in this setting and in general, it's important to remember that the whole point is to play. That is the point. <laughs> there is no other point. Just play. And what that means is different for different people, but like poke around, get weird, you know, like you got limited time to till earthly soils. You might as well have a damn good party while you're at it. So some examples of how you can do this, like a forcible redirect, some concrete activities that you can do, draw something together, make it bad. You don't have to be good at art. Just it, This is fun. You know, the point is not necessarily for it to be fun, but like these things can be fun or revealing or interesting at the very least, like collect sensory information, level up your character. Um, yeah, creating any kind of purpose is a huge help. We'll come back to that in a sec. Make up words, play Scrabble, but you're not actually using real rules. I highly recommend this. We call it Scribble. Um, make forts, build anything out of anything. You can build anything out of anything. Um, you can also mix cornstarch and water together to make oobleck, and that is a different experience altogether. If you rearrange the furniture, the person should be lucid enough that they're not going to freak out because their environment is suddenly unfamiliar to them. So be careful with this one. Um, go for a walk, but bring your supplies, otherwise you'll regret it. Build anything. Like I've said over here with the fort thing, anything is building material. Literally anything. You can anthropomorphize things, right? Like, take this mug put this thing on top of it, and you have the Stay Puft Marshmallow Transformer. Like, it's, it's easy. Give him a name. Give him a background. 
Like create, make things, use your creativity. Play is a skill. It is a muscle. You have to exercise it. If you want to be a good trip sitter, you have to know how to play in your life too. So do this in general. You don't have to be high. Um, play with weird shit. I always keep a backpack of finger puppets on me. Unfortunately, some of those finger puppets are super scary and I pull them out by accident and they're like monster puppets with like spider arms and shit and people are like, oh, so be careful which finger puppets you use for which kinds of people. Ice cream with snow and condensed milk. That's fun. Uh, I keep swallowing air. I'm going to burp soon just so you guys know. Um, but yeah, anthropomorphize things. Give things backgrounds and personalities. Imply meaning. Give things meaning. Things inherently have more meaning on psychedelics. So this is a really good opportunity to form lessons, to form behaviors. Um, you can also read books out loud if you want. This can sometimes be fun, like really fun, especially if you're using accents or reading kids' books. Dr. Seuss can get a little bit scary too, so be mindful of that. But other books, especially comforting books, are really nice. Um, play with LED bulbs. Yes, you would, you end up absolutely the Iliad by Homer. Oh my God, that's intense. <laughs> then there are some other experiences. Um, my favorite one is making tea. I swear by this, and I'll tell you why. Tea, decaf tea. You should have herbal tea on you at all times when you go to trips. It, and um, I'll come back to why. That's also a good idea later. Um, making tea is a mission. It's hydrating. It requires changing your setting. It requires focusing your attention on something new. It's a sensory experience. Tea is fucking comforting as all dick. And um, ultimately, it's a, just like a very easy way to completely shift up whatever your current situation is. I can't advise this one enough. Making tea with people that are uncomfortably high is like a lifeline. And it's good to kind of draw out the process a little bit, but not too much because otherwise it gets stressful. Just like, when is the tea going to be ready? Um, you would be surprised at how satisfying it can be for someone to just hold a warm mug of tea in their hands and like wait for it to cool off and then drink it. And then they're done with their tea and they're like, do I want tea? But by that point, it might be a new chapter. On the other hand, once became convinced that people are islands and communication attempts are futile. <laughs> Um, you can also do easy media if someone, especially if someone's coming down off of a trip or has just had a really intense experience, easy media at the end can sometimes be a good idea. Personally, I have never understood people's propensity for watching TV of any kind on psychedelics. It's quite stressful. You can't follow the plot line. It's weird. You don't really know what's going on, so it's not that funny. <laughs> um, but at the tail end, sometimes nature shows are nice. Usually at the tail end of any psychedelic experience, the phase back into reality is pretty uncomfortable for a at least a little bit. Like sometimes you get lucky and you're distracted through it and then you're sober. Sometimes it's like an eternity and you need a full night of sleep or two actually to get fully back to normal. Uh, you can also drive them around, obviously them in the passenger seat, put the seat back, put the windows down, put the tunes on. Driving is a really satisfying thing for many people when they're tripping, not crazy hard. Otherwise it can feel kind of claustrophobic. Um, or car sickness is another concern here, because it feels like you're doing something and getting something done. The scenery is always changing, but no actual effort is required to enjoy it and experience it. So this is a really good way of like moving someone through a tough chapter of a trip. Then of course there's an exploring the natural environment, go on a nature hike, like go explore things, go play. You can play weird dress up, have a weird fashion show. You can have them do your makeup or do their makeup, but you should be ready for them to be kind of like freaked out if your face starts looking really crazy if they do your makeup, so be ready to wash it off. Swimming is very comforting for a lot of people. Just make sure that they're not so high that they could potentially drown. That is not likely, but you should be ready. But a lot of people find a lot of comfort in water, even showering, for instance. Showering is a great way of helping someone who's tripping. And then there's a consensual shoulder rub or whatever. Um, and this can be like touch, but don't, don't touch like this. Make sure that your, your relationship is touch friendly. Oh my God. I'm getting, s oh my God. Make sure that you ask first, always, every time. Um, all right. Now here's like when we move into the, the all that stuff is mainly for people that are like, they're lucid, they're tripping, it's whatever. 
But now we're going to get into when people are like fucked up. There are two brackets of people that are fucked up on psychedelics. The first is chillin', the second is not chillin'. And oftentimes you kind of know the difference when you see it. If someone is fucked up but they're chillin', you know, they're just super high. Like, it, nothing is like an imminent danger, they're just really high and having a really hard time communicating. Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. Physical activity can be fun sometimes. Um, Depending on your relationship with this person and the kind of tripper they are, sometimes if you just like start doing like something physical and you're like, hey, you should try this out, they'll be like, oh, okay, and like do it as well. They sometimes get really into it, like flowing or like going like this with their hands and just like watching them. Or um, you can make tracer art with them where you can just like draw like the Disney sign or whatever and you can see the whole thing if you're tripping hard enough. Fun lights are always good. This is why people that are tripping really like glow whips, as Danita said, and gloving, and any kind of fun lights that you have on hand can really spice up an experience. Um, you're there basically for comfort. You're supporting them, uh, safety. They might not be able to communicate with you. Let them do their thing. Just make sure that the environment is safe. Like, make them feel loved and, and like you're friendly and welcoming. And Now, here's if they're not chilling. If they are, if something is wrong, basically. You should ask for help if you feel even the slightest bit uncomfortable, but also in general, I think that if someone is not chilling and they're on psychedelics, it's a good idea to have two pairs of hands around. Um, don't try and handle a potentially dangerous or traumatizing situation alone. Don't do it. It's dangerous for you. It's dangerous for them. If someone is really, really, really out of it, if they are in a temporary or extended psychotic episode, or if they're like suffering from severe delusions, which can fall into the former category. Um, this can sometimes lead to people being a flight risk, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Even if you're a great friend, even if you're a great trip sitter, sometimes people just cannot be reached. Sometimes they are like completely out there um, to the point where like your face looks like a dog and your surroundings are blending into your face and this person is just like, holy shit, I don't know what's going on. It's important to remember that most of the time this person is really scared. Um, this is a, tr a tricky one because I've known people in the past who have been like punched in the face by someone that was in psychosis on psychedelics and this person got really pissed because they were friends and like wouldn't talk to them for weeks. But the person was like psychotic and, and in the moment having a psychotic episode and had no idea what they were doing. Like they had no recollection of the incident thereafter. Like people are usually acting out of complete fear or detachment from reality. So it's, it's good to remember that. Um, you just want to make sure that you are keeping a person safe as long as you are willing and able to do so and passing the baton when you're not. Don't take it personally. People are often really afraid of the other people around them or just like can't recognize them as being people. Um, sometimes they have these like very complicated thought processes of like, this person is trying to kill me for one reason or another. That's actually not that uncommon in difficult trips is that someone will be like, my friends are trying to kill me or like so-and-so is trying to hurt, hurt me and harm me. Um, so if they bolt from you, it might be because they literally are like, they're going to hurt me. Even if it's like your partner or your best friend, this happens. Um, if someone's freaking out, but they're not like super out of it, they're just freaking out, they're just uncomfortable, ask them how much they took. Uh, if they took over 150 mics, but often like even 100 mics of acid is a lot of acid, you know, like that's a standard dose granted, but A, you don't know how much is on your tab. Like, you really don't. Unless you know the, the person that laid the tabs and made the acid, you don't know how much is on your tab. <laughs> Sometimes you can get a better idea if, if the liquid was diluted, but how are you going to confirm how the liquid was diluted? You don't know. No, fucking, I have no idea. If someone knows that they took multiple tabs, for instance, or if they took 150 or more micrograms, that is a sizable trip. Like, that's enough to really fuck you up. So, but it's still not dangerous. Um, acid lasts about 10 to 12 hours. Shrooms last four to eight hours. A person will often need one full sleep to get like completely sober and then another full sleep to feel fully settled in their normal routine again. And it can take a few days of adjustment and integration, sometimes longer if a person's trip was like really intense or traumatizing. If this person didn't test it, you can ask them if it had a strong metallic bitter taste because it, it's bitter, it's a spitter. It is possibly an adulterant such as 25i Enbome or the DOX family, which we will maybe come back to, I don't remember. 
Acephthalmin medications, tramadol is not a safe medication. It's an opioid to combine with psychedelics, and I forgot why, truthfully. I think it's because of your seizure threshold lowering, but I'm not positive. I just forget, sorry. Always check your interactions, though, every time. Oftentimes, SSRIs will reduce the effectiveness of psychedelics, but they're not necessarily a dangerous combination. And then ask if this person has taken, like, ask them for their history, because a lot of the time people will get super freaked out about stuff because they just don't know what is and is not normal. I consider anyone that has done a substance, like a specific substance, less than 10 times to be an amateur at that substance. You can do the same drug 30 times and on your 30th time have a completely novel experience. It's never exactly the same. So if someone's like, oh yeah, no, I'm experienced. I've done it like four or five times. They're not. <laughs> Sorry. Like it's just always going to be different. Like where you do it, the quantities that you do it, etc. If you're not sure whether to hospitalize someone for physical problems, um, I get asked this question a lot, like when do I call 911? If someone's freaking out on psychedelics, when is it dangerous? I'll tell you truthfully that more often than not, if someone is on psychedelics, going to the hospital is gonna be much more traumatizing than any experience they would have at home. In some cases, people are just like super insistent and they're like, I will not be satisfied until I'm in the hospital. In which case, like, sure, take them to the hospital. Like, it's their bed, they can sleep in it, that's fine. Um, but physiologically speaking, they're not in danger unless they took something that they thought was one drug that is a actually a more dangerous adulterant, like 25i. Um, the DOX family, I think, can cause hypertension, but I'm not positive. It's not like a dangerous, dangerous. It's more like if you don't know the interactions, 25i and bone can be dangerous. The 2C family rarely might be, I don't think it's like dangerous though. You know, 2Cs are usually not very dangerous, but they could be physically uncomfortable for some people. Question about experience. If they've taken it a few times, then you at least know that it's physically safe for them, right? Other than the subjective difficult trip risk. Um, the word safe, I don't like to use ever because nothing is inherently safe. Let me think about how to answer that. Um, yeah, but I, I've never heard of anyone being allergic to a psychedelic. Maybe I'm just not familiar with it, but I've never heard of that being the case. I think that that would be a pretty astonishingly specific allergy response. Their body would have to be like, no acid for you. Um, yeah, these, these drugs are physically safe for most people. Um, it's also true that people can take a drug a hundred times and then have a seizure on the hundred and first. It's also true that certain like food combinations can trigger these things or that medication combinations can trigger these things. I guess what I'm saying is that you're never guaranteed, but you can also build up kind of a historical profile of how you react to certain drugs. Can acid make a person overheat? Ah, it does raise your body temperature slightly, but, <laughs> but it's not like MDMA at all. I would say that the, the main risk of overheating from acid would probably be anxiety more than anything, and that anxiety can make your heart rates and blood pressure spike, and therefore your body temperature go up. If someone is experiencing a seizure, loss of consciousness, splitting headaches is a big one. Splitting headaches are not normal on drugs, like debilitatingly splitting headaches. That could be a sign of extremely heightened blood pressure, so be very watchful for that. Um, dangerously high body temperature, you'll feel it, like someone's burning up, or other obvious physical complications. Like this isn't just someone being anxious, like they are obviously ill. Obviously, that's a, a cause for physical concern and possibly taking them to the hospital. Or if someone is like, not only am I uncomfortable, but I'm so uncomfortable that I'm like writhing on the ground in pain. It's normal for your stomach to be upset on psychedelics. That is absolutely part of the experience, unfortunately. It's pretty much almost guaranteed. Sometimes you get lucky is what I would say. Being hella nauseous, being like anxious, being uncomfortable generally physically, that's just part of it. For psychological care, this gets a lot stickier. And the reason is that you often need to see like more persistent symptoms to know if this is something that will need to be treated versus something that is acute. If someone is a danger to themselves or others though, that's a totally different story, right? Like if you are afraid for your health or in safety or the health and safety of others, you should probably get this checked. If a person 
has been in a psychotic episode for, this is a complete random number, by the way, don't quote me on this, like 10, 12 hours of psychosis and it's not going away, then this could be an indicator of an episode. But often acute psychosis from psychedelics will only last for the duration of the body of the trip. And oftentimes sleep will end this for people. Sometimes people will come in to like festival tents that I'm working and they'll be in like a full-blown acute psychosis from psychedelics and they'll just like knock out eventually. Like they'll be in a corner and they'll just fall asleep and they'll wake up and be like, why am I in here? <laughs> Which is super jarring for the people that were trip sitting this person that was like flinging poop at people or whatever. Um, if the person is paranoid and to the point of trying to escape or posing a flight risk, which can happen if someone is like, everyone around me is trying to kill me, or I need to defend myself against people, or I need to escape from this place, and this person is like being flighty, like maybe running, it is true that sometimes people end up running through crowded streets, and this is clearly an indicator of hospitalization being necessary. If a person is dangerously delusional or psychotic, this these are all kind of wrapped together then you should call 911 probably. And this will result in um, an involuntary hold. They'll get 5150 a lot of the time, which is an involuntary mental health hold. Um, don't hesitate to call if there's any risk to yourself or others. I have known people who have gone to trips at someone who was clearly in an episode who has opened the door with a knife in their hands. Um, like, this is, this is serious stuff, you know, if someone is, like, completely and totally detached from reality, and again, I can't stress enough that this is really not the norm at all with psychedelics. This is, like, a very rare case that someone would get in this way, and often has other implications for mental health, not always, but often. Um, it's, it's really unlikely that this happens, but it is possible for sure, like, it does happen sometimes. When we're looking at delusions, um, if you outright reject a person's delusions, they will often become very mistrusting of you and be like, well, you're just not in on this. You don't understand what I'm saying. So kind of gently unsticking delusions by like mostly going along with it, but sometimes interjecting like, wait a second, is that the case? Or something like that. I just could not stop swallowing air. This is so uncomfortable. Whoever just came in, please move yourself. Thank you. Um, so kind of gently suggesting alternatives to these delusions. What do you think about calling a mental health hotline or are there specialized dance safe style hotlines? Mm. I think that generally speaking, I would say that calling an ambulance would be a better move for something like this only because mental health hotlines may or may not, I don't know actually enough about the services offered by mental health hotlines. And obviously like the last thing that I want to recommend is bringing law enforcement on the scene. Like that's not ideal at all. Um, in my experience, it is possible to call and ask specifically and only for paramedics, but that is actually a really good question that I should look into more. Oh, don't use alone has a hotline. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you, Orion. Um, but yeah, gently kind of shaking these delusions off just a little bit. Delusions on high doses happen, you know, and common is too strong of a word here, but like it's it's not that uncommon for someone that's tripping balls to be like, I'm God. <laughs> it's like it just happens, to, you know, I, it happens to everybody, don't you know? It often will, again, like fade as the trip fades. If it persists, then that's again, like take this person to get psychological care, commit this person. Just gonna throw in a couple things about Molly because I think this is something that really freaks people out when they see people rolling for the first time and they're like, I don't know if this is okay. Um, the come up on Molly can take between five and 20, sometimes even like an hour. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood this. Once you've started to come up, completing the come up and reaching the peak can take between five and 20 minutes and sometimes a little longer, but usually not longer than 20 minutes, I would say, of you like feeling like you're going up. Once you start coming up on Molly, 
many people find that it's like getting hit by a freight train. Like you're sober and then you're like <laughs> and getting higher and higher and higher. And that can be really intense and overwhelming and also can make you feel very anxious and very nauseous. If someone is not super experienced with rolling, especially if they're taking a higher dose than they've taken before or rolling for the first time, this feeling of being shot out of a cannon when you come up can be super unsettling. And someone might be like, I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't wanna be like this for hours, is this it, is this it? You can reassure them, that's not it. They're gonna plateau and they're gonna feel fucking awesome unless they didn't take enough. <laughs> In which case, you just feel anxious for like three hours and I'm really sorry, <laughs> sucks. Um, yeah, they'll be okay though. Worst case scenario, with underdosing MDMA is that you feel like you've taken a little too much Adderall and you're crashing for like multiple hours. It's not comfortable, it's not fun, but it does end. It's not like the end of the world. Um, pupils get super dilated when you're rolling hard to the point where you can see pretty much no iris a lot of the time. That's scary for some people. It's fine, it's not dangerous. Jaw clenching and chewing can also really freak people out if they see someone that's like, they're probably fine. Like, they're just rolling really hard. They're probably just floored. Um, it looks scary sometimes, though, especially if that person is also tripping. People can do crazy shit with their bodies. I've seen people, like, like that. It's fucking freaky. But, again, they're probably fine. You know, you have to keep an eye on their vital signs and make sure that there's not something actually physiologically wrong with them. But I would say that for the most part, it's fine. And then there's um, your elevated body. Uh oh, is my computer not charging? Uh oh. Hello. Um, then there's the issue of elevated body temperature and sweating. And um, both of these things are really common with MDMA. If someone is like sweating buckets, if their body temperature is super high, then yeah, that's a cause for concern. You need to cool them down. Um, this is why you shouldn't roll in a hot tub. This is why you shouldn't roll in super packed, crowded, sweaty venues if you can help it. And ideally, you'll have some kind of mechanism for cool down, like a wet towel or a fan or something that can make this person feel ever so slightly uh, less garbage. You know, like that kind of thing is kind of dangerous. Um, these people are okay. Do you remember what that's called? I keep thinking uh, when the pupils are, are, yeah, when the eyes are like darting back and forth. Um, I keep thinking astigmas, but I think I got that messed up. No, that's right, nystagmus, that's correct. So- Oh, uh, nystagmus, I almost had it. So close. Um, yeah, so eye wiggles or nystagmus are super normal. Sometimes they get really extreme to the point where someone's looking ahead and it's like, mm -hmm. that's also okay. I'm in drugs go, what's up? Oh, sorry. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, drugs go. Um, yeah, so these people are not generally speaking in danger unless they start seizing or overheating or dehydrating or mixing other substances, in which case things can get a little bit stickier. How do you identify when they're going into a seizure? I'm not sure I've seen it happen in front of me. Um, we're actually gonna come back to seizures today at the end of cool. the session. Uh, so if someone is feeling really uncomfortable on MDMA, you ask them a series of questions. How much did you take? An average dose is between 80 and 130 milligrams. If this person is MDMA naive and they took more than this, they're probably rolling a little bit too hard, but it can depend on your body chemistry. If someone has taken over 200 milligrams of MDMA, just generally speaking, that is usually too much for a lot of people to be comfortable unless they have a tolerance or unless their brain chemistry just happens to be that way. I do know people who can only roll off of like 160 milligrams or more and they've done it only two or three times. Like some people are just like that. Even depending on body weight, it can be like that can be a factor, but some people are just like tiny frames and still need 160, 180, 200 milligrams. It depends on the person. Um, but yeah, if they took a large quantity of Molly, they might be uncomfortable. They might be really nauseous. They might be overheating. Um, sometimes you're rolling so hard you can't get up off of the couch for four hours. That, yeah, that needs probably overshot. 
It lasts about four to six hours, but I would actually say it's three to five hours. Um, the last two hours or so, are you really wishing you could be asleep? And the come up is like 30 to 90 minutes. I would say it's usually around 45 minutes after dosing approximately, but it can take up to an hour and a half. Once you start to feel those like distinct thrills, like you're coming up on an amphetamine, you should know pretty quickly whether or not you're like coming up and leveling out at like a molly plateau or if you've like undershot it and you're not there. Um, generally, if you're rolling, you know. It's not one of those things where you're like, I'm not sure if I'm high because everyone gets that like phantom roll as they dose. Um, you will know <laughs> with certainty. You'll be like, oh wow, this is really, 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 really intense. Ask if they tested it. If not, it could be anything. It could be literally anything. Crystal is less likely to be adulterated than press pills, which is less likely to be adulterated than powder, or that's kind of interchangeable, but crystal is probably like the least risk of being like multi-adulterated, but still high risk because everything is a clear or tan crystal. Everything is. If they're on any medications, they could check, they should check and see if they're on something that could interact with MDMA, like MAOIs, for instance, as we know that is the most dangerous medication to combine with MDMA, generally. Um, if they're on SSRIs, then it might make them feel that kind of like anxious, not full role where they don't fully come up. And ask if they've taken it before. For people that have not taken it before, they don't know their dosage, they don't know the experience, they don't know what the come up is like, they don't know what it feels like when you start rolling. So you can kind of reassure them that if they feel anxious during the come up or about the come up, then that's probably not going to be the whole experience. Like you can reassure them of that. When it's an emergency, overheating is the number one danger of rolling because it can cause seizures and cardiac arrest and all kinds of shit if your body temperature gets crazy high. <laughs> I just can't stop swallowing air. I just can't stop. I'm unstoppable. Seizures on Molly are not normal. <laughs> I once met someone at EDC who was like, oh yeah, like she has a seizure every time she rolls. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? Like, how are you? She's like, oh yeah, it's normal. I'm like, that is not normal. Like, holy shit. You should not be seizing while you're rolling. Seizing one time on Molly may or may not be an eternal indicator of something else. Like it can indeed just be Overexcitation of the brain because seizures is basically just like electrical signals don't respond the way they should. Brain is like this is for a second, um, but it's not normal for it to happen repeatedly. And if it happens once, you should go to a neurologist. You should get an ECG, EEG, <laughs> just to be sure. A splitting bad headache is also not normal and could be an, an indicator of a potentially dangerous adulterant or a stimulant adulterant that can make your blood pressure spike, that can make your blood vessels burst, that can give you a hemorrhagic stroke. So super bad splitting headaches are like if you have like a mild headache, it's whatever, but if you have like an ice pick headache, that's a medical emergency. Seek attention for that. Now we're back to seizures. So uh, a seizure can come in many forms. There are many names for different kinds of seizures of different intensities and severities and um, origins. Seizing can look like active like body movements and jerking. Seizures can look simply like someone kind of spacing out and like occasionally twitching maybe or going completely unresponsive and then not having any memory of the event. Seizures can come in multiple forms and we're not gonna go over specifically what they are today, but you should all be familiar with them if you work events. Um, if you see someone that is convulsing or not responding to any kind of like cues or input, because there's a lot of different kinds of seizures, like I said, and they, they occur in different regions of the brain, you should, the, the, basically you're basically, you're doing like protective support, right? You are cushioning their, their head because if they're flopping, you don't want their head to hit the ground. Ow. Oh, you're piercing. Ouch. Um, if they have glasses, take them off, loosen any tight things that could get pulled or snagged and turn the person on their side. I always advise turning the person on their left side for multiple reasons. One of them is gastrointestinal. I won't get into it, but we'll come back to the recovery position soon. And you should also immediately start a stopwatch if someone is seizing. If a person is seizing for five minutes, it constitutes a medical emergency. Um, alternately, if a person stops breathing for four minutes, they can experience brain damage. So those are the two numbers, four minutes for brain damage for oxygen, five minutes for seizure before it's a medical emergency. Um, repeated seizures are also a medical emergency. 
don't put anything in their mouth. I can't believe I have to say this, but apparently this is the thing that people do where they think we should like prop their mouth open with something or we should hold their tongue so they don't choke on it. They're not going to choke on their tongue. Don't put anything in their mouth. Don't fuck with the mouth. If they're puking for whatever reason, then you should try and clear the airway, obviously, because that's a really dangerous thing for asphyxiation. You should also um, check to see if they have any kind of like identifying card in their wallet or around their neck or on their wrist that says that they have epilepsy or a seizure disorder. Now, sometimes people carry these with them so that, that um, medical professionals can look. Don't like pull their cash out of their wallet unless you're an absolute shady bitch. Just look for the medical card. I'm not inviting you to steal people's money. Don't hold the person down. Also, you literally just making sure that they're kind of like not rolling. Um, yeah, a lot of people have amnesia from seizures. They don't remember that they had an episode. And then uh, for help, obviously. But if a person does not regain consciousness, that's really serious. You should always call 911 or call medical attention if someone's having a seizure. Always. Um, like, actually. And if someone overdoses on an opioid, you should also always call for medical attention. Like, these things should not go unchecked and untreated. Yes, American healthcare fucking sucks, and I'm so sorry, but you also need to get your vitals taken by professionals in the meantime who can monitor you because you are more seizure prone after having one for some time. Now let's look at mania. We're gonna look at some mental health stuff here because all of this becomes more relevant when we're looking at how different drugs can manifest certain unintended side effects, consequences, etc. Um, mania is basically everything turned to 11 and I'm not a mental health professional. So what I say here is just kind of a skeleton outline of mania and bipolar disorder and, and um, psychotic disorders. So bipolar disorder is a mood disorder and it used to be known as manic depression. It's not anymore. Um, but bipolar is diagnosed based off of a manic episode that is clinically significant. It disrupts someone's normal functioning this often is in the form of someone that just goes like really, really quickly, often kind of irritably, does not sleep as much as they need to, has like these huge plans that they're making all over the place, commits to a bunch of stuff, um, is just being incredibly like big and extra and present, either for themselves or for others. It's not always crazy sociable. Frequently, there's a pressure of speech, like a very rapid expression of self. Risky behaviors are super common, like taking risks, taking chances, just kind of like going for things on a whim, setting huge goals, getting distracted. Um, so psychedelics do have the potential, we talked about this, to bring out dormant psychotic type or mood type mental illnesses. However, the question, as I've said before, is whether or not psychedelics are more of a stressor than other things that are equally as capable of bringing out these conditions. So for instance, getting in a car accident is a severely traumatic event for many people, depending on the accident, right? Um, that can act as a stressor as well. Like being under prolonged periods of stress can act as a stressor. The question is whether or not doing certain substances is actually like more of a stressor or is simply something that has the potential to have a really intense emotional impact, psychological impact that can be stressful. Currently underway, um, right now, to my knowledge, the current understanding is that psychedelics are not necessarily any more likely to bring out latent health, mental health conditions like psychotic or mood type disorders than other stressors. Like that's my current knowledge is that they are just like another stressor, you know. If you have a family history, be aware of this. Um, it can be brought out by psychedelics, which I have kindly supplied some Pikachu photos for you, probably completely unnecessarily. Now, looking at psychosis, because this is a heavily, heavily stigmatized thing, and I hope that we can all work to collectively end the stigma around psychosis. This is a common experience for millions of people every year. Psychosis can last for days or weeks or months or off and on, um, but usually it's an acute episode that is either part of a mental health condition or just happens from situational factors. Psychosis is not someone like losing their mind. It doesn't make them crazy. It doesn't make them unworthy of social support. It doesn't make them weak. Psychosis is a symptom of something else going on. 
just like you get a runny nose if you get a cold, psychosis is a symptom of some kind of underlying issue that's happening with a person's health. Destigmatize psychosis. And I really encourage you guys to, if you currently say that's psychotic or you're being psychotic, like really think about the way that that can influ influence someone that you know that you might not even know has had a psychotic episode in the past and could feel like really ashamed, like really stigmatized and would probably not want to tell anyone about having had that experience because it makes people wary. Perfectly normal people have perfectly crazy experiences with psychosis all the time. <laughs> and like, let's erase the word normal as well. I can't believe I just said that. But anyway, um, oftentimes drug-induced psychosis, which can happen from all kinds of different substances, um, is most popularly associated with psychedelics and sometimes with stimulants. But this is often, I would say, from a lack of sleep can be kind of predicted by a person withdrawing or having difficulty speaking and conveying ideas. Disorganized thinking is the main thing here. Um, paranoia is really, really common with psychosis. A person that does not trust the behaviors or actions of their friends, freaky sound, um, or someone who becomes like convinced that there is some kind of delusional plot against them, someone who is having a lot of trouble following conversations or thought patterns. Um, sometimes people that are in, in a psychotic episode become suicidal or have hallucinations. And actually auditory hallucinations are more common with psychosis than with psychedelics themselves. You know, like auditory hallucinations in the form of like hearing conversations and interactions can make it super difficult to tell the difference between reality and internal thought patterns. So psychosis can be really scary again. In fact, that's one of the major things that I want you guys to take away from this today is that the vast majority of the time, I would say, when a person is in a psychotic state or is detached from reality or is acting erratically towards others, it's frequently because of fear. And we should remember this when we're interacting with people that are having those experiences because how would we want someone to treat us if we were so afraid of our surroundings that we started lashing out at people and things that had previously been a source of comfort and love? So remember this when you deal with these situations. Remember that compassion is really, really important here, even if it's not appreciated or remembered. What sorts of speaking difficulties are you referring to? How do they present with psychosis? Um, kind of disorganized thinking basically is like a thought isn't really making sense. A person is saying that they are someone that they're not or asking you to confirm your identity or being very suspicious of you. If someone's thought patterns are clearly like disorganized, right? Like they don't feel sequential, they don't feel logical, this may be an indicator of something going on. Now, the difference between mania and psychosis, because these get conflated, mania is hyperactivity. It's like less sleep, more speech, more action, like grandeur, feeling really big and bold and capable. Psychosis is a loss of touch with reality that can include hallucinations or paranoia or delusions. Manic episodes can have psychotic elements to them, but psychosis doesn't have to be manic. So a person could be in a manic episode and experience both hyperactivity and kind of detachment from reality and disorganized thinking and expression. A person could be in a psychotic episode and they don't have to experience any kind of hyperactivity. So they're separate things and sometimes one has elements of the other. If anyone has questions on that, feel free to ask. Um, in the last probably seven or eight years, I have accidentally identified probably two dozen people that have been in a psychotic episode and no one has picked up on it because people just pegged them as acting weird. And that's a problem because there are easy ways to kind of get a feel for like something's not quite right here. With both mania and psychosis, something that I've noticed is that people start posting really frequently on social media. We're talking like every few minutes or like multiple times a day um, often will have comment threads with themselves, especially if they're commenting things that don't really make sense or are overly aggressive in some cases. This is something where you should reach out to them, and I'll tell you how I would advise doing that in a second. Psychosis is frequently indicated by really bizarre kind of disjointed thought patterns, like things that don't make sense, right? Loss of touch with reality. Mania is like really frequent posting or like really frequent activity. 
and clearly a person not sleeping, often these timestamps will be at like 3.09 a.m., 3.16 a.m., 4.12 a.m., 6.10 a.m. And if you see those timestamps, you could be like, okay, something might be up here. Both oftentimes, oh, and mania is like, who wants to throw this party? I'm ready to throw this party. Can you mute yourself, please, Orion? Actually, I got it. Who wants to throw this party? I'm ready to throw this party. We're going to throw this party. Like, I'm going to do all these things. Like, I'm so excited for the next, like, week and a half of my life. Um, and both will often be very defensive of any kind of suggestion that there is a mental health concern going on. It's not always that way, but it can be kind of difficult to suggest that, like, hey, this might not actually be um, like you at your, at your most lucid. So here's an example of a person whose social media is indicative that there is something else happening here. I'm good, but I'm not too good. Just one O. I'm God. You have kidnapped a Grand Marshal of God Force. All who surround this contraption box, aka city state, you have violated God Force laws. Good luck recreating, recreating the universe, etc. And these were all within like an hour of themselves or of each other. Now, if you see stuff like this on social media, this is an indicator that it's probably a good idea to check in either yourself or to signal boost to other people that something that people that are close to this person that something might be wrong um which can be tough because you might need to find like family member contact etc uh, i think we'll come back to that soon now moving on to serotonin syndrome i know that i mentioned this before but i want to give a little more information on it this is predominantly relevant for mdma and uh, medication interactions with other substances. Serotonin syndrome is excess serotonin. It's too much serotonin, right? Clonus, which is spasming, like jerking, is a major indicator of serotonin syndrome, uh, as well as obviously if someone's consumed serotonergic drugs. A person will often be very feverish and sweaty. They'll be agitated and confused on a mental level. Um, their heart rate and blood pressure will um, their heart rate uh, muscle rigidity as well can happen. If a person has muscle rigidity, this can be a sign that serotonin syndrome is pretty severe. If they're like stiffening up, if their hands are like this, for instance. Yeah, that, that could be life-threatening. Serotonin syndrome is usually very treatable, just uncomfortable with supportive care and fluids and electrolyte balance. Electrolytes are surprisingly important for this, but muscle rigidity and someone being super disoriented and out of it or losing consciousness could be a life-threatening serotonin syndrome situation. So seek medical care for those things. I think that I might've mentioned this in the past, but grapefruit juice has a pretty intense interaction with many substances, but you should always be mindful of combining them with MAOIs and SSRIs and MDMA, anything that acts on serotonin. Grapefruit actually interacts with a shitload of different drugs. Um, I think that I've mentioned why in the past, but if I haven't, I can reiterate it if you're curious. But also, you should be aware if you're doing psychedelics or molly, that if you smoke weed, it will potentiate the effects, sometimes to a potentially uncomfortable degree, especially with psychedelics. It gets you a lot higher if you smoke weed. If you're on the tail end of an intense acid trip and you smoke a bowl, welcome to the next four hours, homie. That's how it's going to be. So be mindful of these interactions. Be mindful of how sneaky these interactions can be. Psychedelics should not be combined with antipsychotics because of the seizure threshold being lowered. Once again, the seizure threshold being lowered means that you are more susceptible to seizure activity, which means that periods of intense stress or intense emotion or something that can make your brain kind of misfire a little bit makes you more susceptible to seizures than you would be otherwise. Um, Tripsit has recently updated this drug interaction page. I highly recommend checking it out. It's not flawless, it's not foolproof, but this is a great way of doing kind of a preliminary check to see the relative danger of mixing substances. Although I should be very explicit in saying that just because there's a green arrow here doesn't mean that this is safe. It just might mean that it is like not as physiologically dangerous as other things. You should always do your research and be careful. This is the last thing I'll go over today and something that I really hesitate to include always because I don't want people to take this too seriously. It is possible sometimes to stop a trip prematurely. However, this is an emergency situation. This is not something that should ever be employed lightly because 
these substances that you need to stop a trip are frequently not particularly comfortable and also might have a deleterious impact on the person's ability to process and integrate their experience if it's ended before it should and can be kind of traumatizing. Weed will not bring you down from mushrooms. Weed will bring you back up on mushrooms. Weed will potentiate any psychedelic. Weed is a, a, like a potentiator of drugs in general for the most part. If you want to get less high on mushrooms, smoking weed is not the way to go, I promise. Um, the substances that can be used for actually ending the psychedelic part of a trip, but without a guarantee of this, everyone is different, are Haldol, Seroquel, Trazodone, to name three. Trazodone is an atypical antidepressant, whereas Haldol and Seroquel are antipsychotics. Haldol is often used in emergency rooms. Um, some benzos are often used by like emergency personnel just to calm a person down if they're really agitated, which can be um, dangerous. I personally don't remember, ben don't re recommend benzos as a trip killer because they don't like cut the psychedelic part of your trip. They just make you calmer as you deal with it. And that is like, and also I personally am really, really wary of benzos for reasons that I'll elaborate on next week. Um, if you're going to use something for killing a trip, I would recommend trazodone as being probably the like lowest risk of these. But this can end up causing psychological distress and they're not guaranteed to work. Like this isn't a guaranteed method. So be very cautious when you're using this. That is all for today. And we will come back on Tuesday of next week and finish up the last tiny little bit of this. And then we only have a couple more lectures. Have a great day. Night. Bye guys.